Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Real Influencers Project. I'm your host, Craig Reynolds. Every once in a while in our lives, we run across someone that instantly becomes part of your family. You know right away that they're your people. And when I met today's guest, that is exactly what happened. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Charles Townsend. Hey, Craig, how you doing, my friend? Oh, uh, dude, uh, it is been to here, way too long since I have seen your giant head, man. It has been way too long. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, you know, it's been it's been a long time. It's been a Charles, long time. I, I, you know, you and Jason and I have a, a a thread that we bounce music back and forth, but that is it. I haven't seen you. I haven't seen your face. Since I retired, I retired in 2004. I don't know when you shut it down, but yeah. before we get there, let's let's dial it back. So for those of you that don't know, Charles is one of the all-time greatest BMX racers of all time. Um, legend in his own right and has written for some of the most incredible companies that were out there um, and generally just a great person as well. Um, I'm very fortunate to have him in my corner in my inner circle, which is a pretty small inner circle, so I'm glad he's in it. Um, Charles, let's, let, let's dial this all the way back. The first time I met you, or the first time I saw you, you were riding for boss and you had oh, black geez. magic on the, you had black magic on oh, the back of your pants geez. and you were yeah. like full grown, you're a full grown man at this point. You're <laughs> huge. I was like, Charles is giant. It's a big dude, like a big dude. But, but before we got there, before you got there, like, how did you get started into racing BMX bikes? Cause obviously oh, BMX God. isn't the most mainstream kind of a thing no 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 not at all i can remember i was there was a kid around the block and he had like the very first bmx bike that i ever seen and we're going so far back it was called webco yeah yeah it was a webco bike and he was you know always kind of rolling through the neighborhood bunny hopping curbs and i just thought that was like the greatest thing so i kind of and he was quite a bit older than me so I asked him, I said, hey, you know, what's what's going on? Oh, you know, this is a BMX bike. You know, it's worth back then, you know, hundreds and hundreds of dollars. And I'm like, well, and he goes, yeah, there's a local BMX track at Hellyer Park in uh, in San Jose. And it's it's funny because the, the BMX track was on an old dump site. So I don't know if you know this, but at least here in California, you can't build anything on a, on, a, on an area that's been a dump. So aside from a bmx track i guess you can't build houses or i mean like I, you yeah. we used to race in horse farms dude who cares <laughs> yeah, exactly yeah. pig farms and stuff like yeah, that breathe in all that shit yeah for yeah, Good yeah, luck. yeah yeah so um it was a bmx track that was there for years so i just followed him down to the races one day and just got hooked fell in love and just started you know going there on the weekends i think i must have been about 13 or 14 years old and that kid that kind of told me about it i don't want to say introduced me to it but just told me where the track was and kind of what it was about he since kind of went to the wayside he was just kind of he had he was a neighborhood guy that had the cool bike mm -hmm. but never really participated too much you know just was fronting a little bit but right. yeah that's, that's how i kind of got started you know just on the local scene at a local track and and this is back then when you could go to a local you know local bmx race on a saturday and a sunday and have like 90 motos you know, just, right. you know, a single point BMX race. And just, it was, it was, it was good fun. How long did it take when you started racing before you're like, this is my jam and I am doing this at least for now. You know, that's a hard, that's a good question, Craig. And it's hard to answer. I just, that one weekend started and I, and I, if I recall that next weekend, was just a normal weekend race. And I think about three or four weekends later, there was a big double point or triple point race. And, you know, back then, you know, those single point races, those double point and triple point races were like the big thing. Yeah. I remember there was a race coming up about, gosh, three weeks from that point in time. And I was wondering, God, how can I get the money to, how many lawns can I mow to get the money to, to try to be able to participate and get signed up and all this stuff. So I'd say probably within the first month, I was hooked. Right. I was, I was hooked. Was your family going with you to the races as well when you were a little dude? No, so you know, I don't think you were ever a little dude. I think you were six two from the time I met you. From the time you were born, you came out straight out of the womb. <laughs> no, you know, um, single parent. You know, um, my mom was just working her butt off to raise three kids. Um, my sister was out of the house. She was already down the road, but it was my brother and I. So she was just working really hard to keep a roof over her heads. My brother's a little bit, a lot older than me. 
Mm-hmm. So he wasn't, we're, we were close, but we're not close. We just have, you know, different generations, different, you know, mindset. Yeah. So um, as far as like family participation, I didn't have that. But as I started racing more and more and more, I got to know, you know, some of the local families and stuff. And actually my really dear friend to this day, his name is Chris Hall. And his parents, mom and dad, coolest people kind of took me under their wing. And I just started, you know, traveling to all the, you know, races with them. And this was back then when, again, you had, you know, local races that had 80, 90 motos. And then you could race, you know, three tracks in one weekend. So they would drive my butt from, you know, San Jose to Merced, you know, Atwater, what we call in California, the Valley. And so they kind of came, became my BMX family. Mm -hmm. It's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing how the connections that you build in the world of BMX. And I'm sure that it's like that in other sports as well, but man, it, it's such a tight knit group of people. I mean, as you know, as we turn pro and we're racing pro, we are seeing each other every single weekend. It was like, this is my crew and I want to beat them on the track, but we're going to go to dinner afterwards and hang out and yeah. go to the movies. Like yeah. it's really yeah. interesting how you can blur that line from I want to beat Charles so bad to Charles, where are we going to dinner? Yeah. And you did yeah. that with so many families growing up as well, which is wonderful. And I, that's one of the things that I love about the sport so much. Yeah. You know, again, you know, uh, there, and it's funny because in BMX, there's, we meet a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And, and I think in our era of the BMX, and I was talking to Bill Nelson about this a couple of few years ago, Danny Nelson's dad, who was, team, as you know, and for who don't know, was team manager for GT for many, many, many years. And that dude ran the whole program. Yo, oh my gosh, my gosh. I so I think that with the BMX group and people that we traveled with, yeah, I mean, there's just those people. I mean, yourself, you know, you and I and Jason Richard kind of have this thread going on, but there's there's those relationships that you you build and there'll be a time where you won't talk like you and I, you won't talk to anybody for years or for a long period of time. And then it was just like yesterday, yes. you know, and mm-hmm. that's, I mean, that is explains the whole BMX net, you know, relationship to me because I've got friends, yep. I mean, Todd Corbett, yourself, Gary Ellis. I mean, we won't talk for years and then I'll send, you know, Gary Ellis just out of the blue, you know, uh, um, a middle finger emoji and who will just start laughing. So yeah. it's, um, I was pretty thankful and I'm, I'm very, I love the relationships that I have that I've gotten through BMX. So it's, it's cool. And, you know, with going back a little bit with the local BMX racing and stuff like that, if it wasn't for this Chris Hall family and his mom and dad, and I tell them this all the time, I said, dude, if it wasn't for you and your folks, I would not have gone anywhere in the sport of BMX because they're the ones that pretty much dragged my butt all around to the local races and stuff. And they dragged me in my first couple nationals, you know, I got my butt kicked. And then eventually later down the road, he kind of, you know, Chris got a little bit older, got a little car and I just kind of kept going with it. But if it wasn't for him and his family, yeah, yeah, I am. It's funny. Cause I t- was telling his dad that one, that story one day and he goes, no, 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 you were the, you were the one out there pedaling the bike. I said, yeah, but you were the, you're the one that got me to the races because, you know, he's, he's pedaling the car. Yeah. 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 And, you know, and it's, and it's not like my mom didn't support me. She supported me the best way that she could, but she, mm-hmm. you know, she was out there getting her hustle on to be able to keep a roof over, you know, my, me and my brother's head. And so, um, yeah, so I was pretty, pretty lucky, pretty fortunate. Yeah. Start for your mom. I mean, you're a big kid, man. You like to eat. I know. <laughs> Can't fool me. I've been around yeah, you, Charles. I tell everybody it was all that rice and kimchi you used to feed me. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome yeah, um, so yeah. how long did it take before you got on your first team um and i think like your first factory sponsor was was it boss it was yeah. Boss. <clears throat> how'd that come yeah. About? yeah 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 so carlo the owner of boss back in the day he had a knack for picking up young talent you know so i did really well on the local scene and um, There's like you guys and that boss team. I don't even know how to describe it, but it was, I don't want to call you guys hoodlums. No, <laughs> you guys are so cool. Like you guys were always at these bears. <laughs> yes, but you guys were always winning. You guys were fast. You were a threat. Like I had to race down on McCurdy, and that dude yeah. was fast. Like yeah. looking at like Nick Libertor, who was below yeah. me, who was fast. Like so many fast people. That dude had a good eye for talent. Like he, I, you know, Carlo, really was, good. 
Carlo built a really good product and he had a mm-hmm. knack for, for finding um, diamonds in the rough, you know, and he was always mining, you know, and <laughs> he was always, he was, but, you know, I just started doing well in the local scene. And I think I was like, I think I was about 18 and I went to um, an ABA national in Reno and it was in the, back then it was the Lowler, event center for UNR. I don't know what they call it now. Short track. It must've been maybe 400 feet. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It was really short and tight, you know, typical ABA track. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and I won, I won 18 over expert. I'm like, was that your first national win? It was first national win. Wow. Yeah. and, And obviously leading up to that, I had gone to some nationals, just got my butt kicked, you know, come back and do the local thing again, you know, go to a local national, get your butt kicked. And and it's funny because that was like, it was like, oh, shit. Okay, that's how you do it. And it was just right. like learning how to ride a skateboard for the first time or snowboard. And it's funny because if I recall, I think, because, you know, Eric Carter and I, you know, good friends, you know, rode on the same teams together. Yeah, we're going to get there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I want to say that that was his first national win also. Really? Yeah. So some similarities there. So a little, little, little fun fact there. But so after I won, it's like, oh shit. Okay, that's how you do it. You know, just well, who who was in that main? Who or well, who was in that? I, I can't even. That I can't even. Range. Dude, that age. I, range. I can't even. I can't even remember. And you know, actually, Craig. Actually, I want to say, I can't remember if it was the expert class or it was open, like seventeen over open or something. But I won, and it's like, okay, oh shit, that's how you do it. So then the next, the next, I think two weeks later, there was a race in Arizona in Phoenix. And I want to say it was about three internationals. Weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. want to say it was about three weeks later. And at the time I had just ridden for a local bike shop. They supported me and, you know, super cool people. And then I don't remember how, how it all came about, but I ended up hooking up with Carlos somewhere, somehow at a race at a local track, you know, cause he was here in Oakland and I lived in San Jose. So it wasn't far from each other. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to say that I bumped into him or ran into him at a race and gave me a frame and Jersey and stuff. I'm like, Oh, and I thought, Oh, okay. You know, factory team, I'm factory sponsored now. And then um, went to Arizona and won again. I'm like, Oh, so now what starts happening is you, the funny thing is you always, you have the, or had the ability. It was just believing in myself, the confidence. You know, and it's just like in anything, any sport, you know, you, you see these, you know, especially what's going on now in football. I mean, you know, with the wild card plays and all that stuff, it's all about, I mean, you know, you can do it. It's just, you got to have the confidence just like in any sport, anything in life. So now my, not so much my ego, just my confidence. Cause I don't ever think I was really a big egotistical person, but my confidence level was like at a really all time high. And then from there I started, you know, I started winning a couple races, started, um, started traveling a little bit, you know, and getting some wins under my belt. And it was funny because I went to, I went to a race in the Midwest and I was riding for boss and I really didn't have any accommodation set up and how to get to and from the hotel and all that stuff. So I can't remember how it all came about, but I think at that time, I want to say, Eric Carter was riding for free agent at that time. And yeah, he was running for free agent at the time. And we kind of befriended each other a little bit somehow, some way. So I was trying to get to that. I, another great dude. Another yeah, wonderful, yeah, wonderful super, person. super cool guy. Yeah. And um, I think the race was like in Lincoln, Nebraska or something like that. And I think I got hooked up with Mrs. Carter somewhere somehow because I needed kind of a ride to him from the hotel and kind of somewhere to kind of crash and all that stuff. And, you know, in the BMX world, everybody's like, yeah, come crash. Get in here. Crash. Get this room on the floor. No kidding. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's a room on the floor. It's all good. So coincidentally, Don Krupe and Mrs. Carter somehow, some way. So anyway, I got hooked up with Mr. Krupe and he shoveled me around and, you know, crashed on his floor and he gave me some hotel space. So we kind of became friends a little bit and then he kind of put the bug in then the owner for agent Yvonne Shoup. Right. And that relationship kind of materialized and kind of came, came about a little bit. And then next thing you know, a couple, you know, a couple few months later, I hooked up with free agent. Unreal. It's, it's yeah. amazing how it happens, right? Like not even thinking twice about it, but just that relationship building, those influences that are like, this guy 
is the one the halls for you. We're going to bring this kid around in yeah. your, a major influence for your life. Like what a wonderful gift. Yeah. What a yeah wonderful I, gift. I, you know, and I, and it, you know, it, I just sometimes like, like this, you know, us talking about things, you just, it's just this warm sensation coming over that comes over me. I know it sounds corny and everything, but I was pretty fortunate. I just kind of ran into the right people at the right time. You know, it's just, I've been, I've been pretty flipping lucky, you know? Yeah. So, well, Charles, you're a good person though. And, and I've said this before, you know, when good people do things, good things happen and you're a good person. Like you were intimidating and scary on the track, right? I think you and probably Barry McManus are the two dudes that put me over the turn the most. And you're two of my favorite people of all time. And I never took it personal because I knew it was business. Like all I right. knew what we were doing. I left the door open. Charles is coming. <laughs> Dang it. Second turn, Blue Springs, Missouri. Dude. Yeah. I'm, double a. I'm winning open and I'm like, I'm going to double the red. I'm doubling. I go into the turn two and all of a sudden I feel it. I'm like, damn it, Reynolds. And I had like a fraction. I had like a fraction to get around you. But I didn't. I, I didn't get it. And yeah. He had enough but, elbow on me, and I went over the turn, and it was done. I got a video of it somewhere too. I you, you know, it's funny is as I started getting older, that used to be my handicap. That because I was getting fat and old, dude. That was the only way I could keep up with you youngsters. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible how we have to make adjustments, right? Like I used yes. to be like, I want lane eight because I'm going to drop everyone from lane eight. No one's going to cut me off. And then it was like, shit, I need at least lane six. Yeah, I can't get over anymore, and you just yeah. you get slower, man. It's crazy. Yeah, Nuts. yeah, yeah. All right. So after free agent, you go from free agent to Hutch. Yeah. So it was. I, I mean, another after, crazy good team. Like when you look at that yeah. lineup, like yeah, ah, sheesh. I don't. Even, I don't even know what's going on. Yeah. So th so that year, I had raced for free agent, and I kind of I racked up a couple wins, and and so mind you, I went from you know, doing really good on the local scene and then kind of jumping into the national scene a little bit and started winning some races and, and looking back at it now, it was just, it was kind of numb. And I don't mean that in a bad way, but it was just, I was just like going about racing, yeah. you know? And I was, I was just a kid that grew up on the East side of San Jose. And for people that don't know that part of town, it's pretty rough. And now all of a sudden I'm out and traveling and kind of doing what I love and riding BMX bikes and just doing my thing. So I was just kind of, I don't want to say going through the motions, but just kind of having fun, you know, just doing it, you know, and, and, you know, started winning a bunch of races and started doing really well, started traveling with, you know, at the time was uh, Don Krupe, the team manager for agent, you know, traveling on tour, you know, and I'm just like having a blast. And um, now all of a sudden we come towards, you know, we come at the end of the year and I'm in contention for number one amateur. Ooh. Yeah. That's and a I'm big like, one. Number one amateur one. was like, yes, th that's a, that's a big yes. title to get, man. Yeah. I was in contention for, for number one amateur. So um, I had never felt that kind of pressure, I guess, you know, that kind of, you weren't thinking about it, man. You were just rolling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just rolling, you know, keep this shit out of the way. Yeah. Yeah. Mentally yep. I wasn't preparing for, you know, cause like back then, you know, you had the, the, the amateurs, the factory sponsored amateurs that had been doing it for a while, you know, Mikey King, Brett Romero, you know, th those amateurs that, yeah, that's what they were shooting for. Whereas me all through that year, I was just looking forward to the next race. It, that whole national number one amateur never kind of came into play. I was just, I, I guess that's a good way of looking at it in a sort, because just let everything fall into place. Cause I remember one time Eric Carter's dad told me, he goes, Later, when I started focusing on the number one title, he would tell me, dude, don't worry about the title. Worry about the steps to get there. All that other stuff will fall into place. Brilliant. So my first year, you know, I just kind of had that mentality. And then all of a sudden I get to the Grands in Oklahoma. I'm like, ooh, okay, so now what? And as Greg Romero would say, I got Purvis. <laughs> <laughs> I had some purpose over time. I, I was really, really nervous, you know. And um, I don't think that I, at that grants, I didn't qualify out of the quarters. So wow. I really bummed. And it was just a whole new experience. I've never been had that type of pressure, you know, that type of scenario. But, you know, it is what it is. You live and learn. So that year. I, I remember Eric Kerner told me a story about when he was up for a title and Doug Davis pulled him off the side and said, you ain't ready, dude. And Tori totally stacked him out. Like he's like, I guess Doug was really good with the mind games, right? And he said something to him, and he's like, he was right though, man. I yeah. came back the next year and got it, but I was like, 
wow, man, that's crazy. Like, yeah, I'm you know, and that's it's, crazy. And, and you know, what's funny is when you're, when you're young like that, or, you know, and in that moment, I would think that, you know, Doug Davis may, and I think I heard, I think Eric told me that comment, but I would think at the time I was thinking, God, what a jackass, you know, that's not cool. But right, then now right. as we get older, we're a little more mature. You think about those comments, you're like, yeah, that was probably right. You know? Yeah. It's, totally. it's, and, and, it's, and what a good mind game too. Cause like, look, yeah. I'm, I'm going to beat this dude off the track real quick. Yeah. Yeah, roll yeah. by his pit real slow. Yeah, yeah exactly. Break check him in the pits. Like, just let yeah. him know I'm here. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But that um, was, when he told me that, I thought the same thing. I was like, oh, man, why would he do that? I'm like, oh, I yeah. know why. Because he wanted to win yeah. the title, too. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, no, no. And um, so that was – so that next year, the plan was that I had talked to, to Don Krupe at the time and then um, Yvonne Shoot. I said, hey, I'd really like to turn pro next year. And they kind of, you know, were kind of okay with it, not okay with it. They wanted me to stay amateur for another year, and I was gonna, I was gonna go pro. And then I get a call from back. Yeah, you know, he, he's always gonna be an idol of mine. But you know, back then when you're 18, 19 years old, he, you know, he's a super idol. So I get a call, I get a phone call from Mike Miranda. I knew you were gonna say it was hot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how he got my number or anything like that. And I remember his first words were, hey, hey, bud, you, are you ready for your offer? And, you know, that was he didn't say hello. He didn't say I think he might have. He, yeah, he didn't say hello. He just said, say, hey, this is Mike Miranda. And I said, oh, hey, what's going on? And I was trying to play cool. And he goes, you ready for your offer? And that was all he said. And then he just kind of laid it out for me. And then so that year I decided to take the deal with Hutch. And I stayed amateur another year. And okay. uh, Yvonne was really upset and bummed because at that time, um, Hutch had poached a couple of her riders, myself, Eric Carter, Mike Luna. Oh. Mike Luna. And I think I think it was Robert Zainow also. That's, yeah. She was yeah. she was pretty upset. And and I mean, I can understand. I can understand. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. So that next year. Um, went on to ride for Hutch and was Eric Carter, myself, um, Robert Zeno, Mikey Luna, um, Chris Bacchus. Of, Chris Bacchus. Yep. 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 And, and then, um, and we just, we just tore it up. And that was my real first year spending a lot of time back East and racing mm -hmm. the mail circuit that year. I didn't do, didn't do too much, um, too much of the ABA stuff, but spent a lot of time back east in the South and some NBL stuff, which was good because that gave me time to mature as a rider and in the amateur ranks. You know, I, I think looking back at it, even though I wanted to turn pro that year with free agent, it did me good to stay amateur another year because you mature a little bit more. Right. You know? Right. And, and having more because then now when I was on Hutch as an amateur, now I was kind of like, um, I don't want to say expected to win, but of myself, I expected myself sure. to, 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 to be at the next level. So it, I, it matured me quite a bit. You know, I grew and it was, it was a good move to stay amateur. Um, and, you know, I ended up getting NBL number one. And then Eric Carter and I, we went overseas to England and we both won world championships. So it was, it was a good year. It was a, it was a good thing for me, but you know, that year on Hutch, man, it was it was a learning experience, a good, fun learning experience because we went on tour for like seven weeks and God, we were a shit show on the road, man. Oh my, it got, and not in a bad way, Craig, but it got, it got so bad that Mrs. Carter had to fly out and make sure that all the stories and rumors that she was hearing weren't true. <laughs> <laughs> you got put in check by Eric's mom. <laughs> oh my God. I mean, you know, we were the oldest, the oldest I mean, I was the oldest rider on the team at that time, and I was 19. And we were traveling for seven weeks on tour in a motorhome supervised by Hutch Jr., <laughs> who at the time wasn't much older than me. You know, I think he was a couple years older. So here you have a 22-year-old team manager 
Uh, Mike Miranda was a pro at the time. So, you know, he's a shit starter all, all, you know, and, and it was all good fun, you know, all good fun. And then, you know, there's me and then you've got, you know, a 19 year old and Eric Carter at the time was 15 or 16 and some young amateur traveling in the motorhome, you know, through the Midwest and just, yeah. So it, it got to, I mean, we didn't do anything crazy. None of us ended up in jail or anything, but it got to a point to Mrs. <laughs> Mrs. Carter had to fly out and make sure that everything was, <laughs> everything was copacetic. <laughs> but it was, it was funny. It was, you, it's funny that you, you said that you stayed uh, amateur for next year. I told my dad before I turned pro that I was going to stay amateur one year. You know what he said to me? You stay amateur your whole career? I was like, really? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, fine, dad, I'm turning pro. He, he wasn't yeah. having none of that shit. Yeah, dude, like, you're, no. you're, you're, you're dad's cool people, man. He was always, <sighs> he kept it real. Yeah, he, he kept <laughs> No joke. He oh, kept well, he's going to love hearing that, uh, that we, we chatted. He, he's going to yeah. love to hear Yeah, yeah. We, we, have a couple, we have a couple Facebook conversations, you know, every so often. Your dad's good yes. people, man. <laughs> yeah, they, are, they, they ask about you every once in a while, too. So yeah. I don't think that you've ever been. Yeah, no, no. All good, um, all good. So you stay amateur for that career, for that year. And then you're going to turn pro. Um, yeah. Are you still on Hutch or does this switch over to? Yeah. Hutch so what Hutch? happened is. Did you go from Hutch, Diamondback? From Hutch to Diamondback? Is that what you did? Yeah. Yeah. So no, there, there's a little bit of a gap in there, but Hutch had kind of gone through some financial issues and they were cutting back with their team being sold, mm-hmm. this, and that, blah, 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 blah. So, you know, mind you, I'm still a, a soft hearted 19, 20 year old kid. Right. And I was just totally bummed that. Hutch was doing away with the program and I wanted to turn pro and I really didn't have, um, you know, I wasn't going to have the backing, you know, to be able to get to these races. So at the time I had called, I don't shit. I don't even think anybody knows this story. So I haven't really told too many people, but I was so desperate and I wanted so bad to go to Columbus because, you know, back then Columbus, Ohio, that was like the first NBL race of the year um, for the season. Christmas the, classic. Christmas, one of the Christmas greatest classic. races. Yeah, God, yeah. I love that. You know, it, the track was always cool. It was indoors. Everything was there. You didn't have to, you know, it was, it was a shit. Yeah. It was, it was yeah. one of the best it was, races. It was like the, the event of it all, right? Yeah. The, yeah, the yeah. atmosphere and everything about it was just super cool. Yeah, it was super cool. So that was when I wanted to turn pro and I had kind of been thinking about that. And then knowing that Hutch was going to do well with the program and I was kind of, I was kind of bummed. So I had called Gary Ellis's dad. Mm. And at the time he, um, at the, if no, you know, for people that didn't know, Gary Ellis's dad ran adventure travel. So he booked all the flights and all a lot of flights for all the yes. teams and all that stuff, right? They were so, the go-to. They knew right. everything. I was like, yeah. he was calling and giving my name, and they yep. were like, "All right, Craig, you're yep. gonna be on this flight. Your yep. bike bag is gonna get on. Here's your ticket. Do 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 do. Done. Thank you. Yeah, brilliant, 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 brilliant. Yeah. And you know, back then, before all the whole, you know, the e-ticket and the email and all that stuff, you know, you just got a ticket in the mail, and you yeah. knew it was coming. Yeah. You know, it was, yeah you Never it questioned coming. it. No, nope, yeah. it was on time, like clockwork. You know. Mm-hmm. So I called him and, you know, everybody always thinks travel agents can get free tickets and all this stuff and got the hookup on tickets. So, you know, that was my thought. So I called Ellis Sr. And I said, hey, you know, I was I was bummed and he could tell that I was, you know, do you have is there, I got to get to Columbus. And I don't remember how I worded it. You know, it's my first race. I want to turn pro there. Gary Ellis's dad, rest in peace, was another cool dude. He actually bought me a ticket to Columbus, Ohio. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't remember how it all came out or how it all came about. I remember just having a conversation with him. Hey, you know, I need, I really want to go. And so anyway, he ended up, he ended up buying me a ticket, Columbus, Ohio. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So he bought me a ticket and got to Columbus. And I remember signing up. I'm standing in line with my um, new membership form to turn pro all shaking and, you know, just kind of like, <laughs> am I sure I want to do this? You know, just kind of shake it. And at the time, Tooney, Turner Henry was there. And he comes up to me and he kind of gives me a nudge. He goes, yeah, I, 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 what did he say? He goes, I, I pegged you for being the first one to turn pro. Cause at that time there was a group of amateurs, um, 
like myself, Billy Griggs, you know, were about at that ripe time. About That age you know, range, I'm telling yeah. you, was incredible. Like, I yeah. still say to this day, there is a, a block of range that that era was second to none. Yes. So yeah. many fast, yeah. incredible dude years. Like, this is, yeah. it's like a block of legends. When right. you look at and everybody, it was, it was it was a deep it was a deep talent pool. So not only no doubt. not only the talent, not only that that block of age of talent in the ABA, but also in the NBL back at that time. Yes, you know? so yes, because it, 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 was, it, it was so interesting how different the sanctions were, and you yeah. would go to each race, and it was just such a different vibe between yeah. the two. I could never put a finger on it, like what made yep. them so different. Yeah, couldn't figure it out. I'm like, I yeah. don't know, it's yeah, just yeah, different. Yeah. And um, so he goes, yeah, I, I kind of had you pegged for being the first one to turn. I'm standing there in line, you know, all nervous. <laughs> and um, anyway, got signed up and, signed, you know, race pro open and all that stuff. And I remember I was so juiced and so amped. And it was funny because I actually probably I was nervous racing B pro because, you know, that was the first pro. Yeah. But it's weird because at that race, I think I tried harder in pro open. Because in Pro Open, I was racing guys that I looked up to and admired, you know, Tommy Brackens, Pete Longkarovich, you know, and and it was funny because in one of the Pro Open motos, after the race, Tommy comes up to me and goes, dude, you need to slow down. <laughs> because I was just <laughs> wide open trying to pet because I was in second behind Pete and Tommy was behind. And I was, he, he saw me just trying to pe- get every pedal I could in, in each turn over each jump to try to catch me. Cause I wanted to beat, I wanted to beat Pete Lonkarovich as, you know, as a B pro rider, you know, that's, yeah, of course. that, that, that would have been like the shit. And Tommy goes, dude, you just need to slow down. <laughs> he goes, you're, you're riding way over your head, which yeah, it probably was. <laughs> so anyway, so I had, um, I won B pro at Columbus, Ohio. And I'm like, Oh shit. So when I, and I think it was like 900 bucks, which, that's a whole nother story. You know, pro purse is just, that's a whole nother story. Oh, anyway, I can't so, get into it. Yeah. So I got home and I called Mr. Ellis and, you know, at that time we didn't have cell phones or anything like that. I remember landing in San Francisco airport and he was like the first phone call that I made. And I told him, thank you. You know, I had one and he said, congratulations. And I paid him back. You know, I think, awesome. uh, I think, I think I won like 850 bucks and I think he bought me the two. And, you know, I mean, there was no obligation when he got me that ticket, he didn't say, Hey, you know, you need to pay me back or whatever, whatever. He did it out of the kindness of his heart and right. I paid him back for it. So, yeah. And I don't think very many people know that story. That's so, awesome. Thanks for sharing that. That's your real senior was, was, was my, you know, even though I showed up in a Hutch Jersey and I used my, you know, cause I think I was still on contract for the rest of that year, regardless of uh, their financial yeah. issues and all that stuff. But, uh, you know, Gary Ellis senior was my first, uh, my first pro sponsor, so to say, he bought my ticket to, to Columbus, Ohio. Yeah. And it's funny because I, years later, I think I said something to Gary Jr. about that. And I don't even think he knew. Really? Yeah. yeah. I don't even think he knew. And not that his dad was keeping secrets from him or anything like that, but it was just senior was just cool like that. He didn't have to let everybody know. And, you know, Gary Jr. is kind of like that also. He's the type, kind of like myself, he, he doesn't have – to put it all out there, you know, right. It, it, it is what it is. So yeah, that was a cool story. I don't, and eh, not too many people know that one. That's awesome, man. They, and you're right. Gary's always been another one of those really good guys that doesn't seek all this crazy attention, even though he could jump on social media and everyone would be like, yeah, Gary yeah. Ellis, that's crazy. Yeah. He's yeah. just, they're doing his own thing. And that's, that's, that, that's respectable. He, he definitely flies, flies under the radar. You know, yeah, I know. Flying. I've asked him to do these things. He's like, "Yeah, man, I don't know." I'm like, "Come <laughs> on, man!" Like, he's this elusive. Him, Richie Anderson, Stu yeah. Thompson. I'm like, dudes, can we want to do it now? No, just flat yeah. out. Richie's like, "No, not doing it." Yeah, right? like, I, and you know, I I don't think it's because they're. I, I think they're just in some on the BMX track. They are as loud as the day is long. You know what I mean? But away from it, you know, that's 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 kind of like, you know, on the BMX track, they can speak as loud as they want. But when they're away from that, they're just really quiet people. And they're right. not, you know, and some people it took me a, a while when I first started traveling with GT bicycles and all stuff. And I got to know Eric or Gary 
I just think, God, you know, what a, what a jackass. He don't talk to anybody, you know, and he's this <laughs> and that. And, you know, but it's just, that's his personality. He's not that, you know, like you and I, Craig, we can go up and talk to anybody, you know, and start right. a conversation. And, you know, there's certain people that are not like that, you know, Richie Anderson, as you mentioned, you know, Stu Thompson's cool if you get them, you know, but, and Gary, but they're just not like, yes. You know what I mean? And, mm-hmm. and I can respect that. I can respect that. And Gary's Absolutely. One of, one of my best friends, you know? Right. I mean, I love those guys. Richie was like yeah. the first guy that ever like trained me. Like right. when I was a kid, like yeah. a little kid. And I, I, I got so much respect and admiration for all three of those guys. I just want to have them on here just to hear how they got started. Like you, right? I'm yeah. like hearing your stories about how you started in NorCal and traveling the world and your titles. And who would have thought this dude that was racing at a garbage dump is going to become national champion. I, it, you know, Craig, it's sometimes I'll sit at work and I'll just start laughing to myself and somebody will come in and say, what are you laughing about? What's so funny? And, and I'll think about some of the stuff we've did on the road, you know, or, or things that have happened. And I'll kind of like chuck to this day, last night, to this day, I will still have a, I still have dreams in regards to something about BMX. So do I. To this day, whether mm-hmm. it's, <laughs> whether it's missing a moto, <laughs> you know. Oh, I've never had that dream. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah, well, it hasn't ever happened, but I'll have a dream like, oh, shit, my moto's coming up. You know what I mean? <laughs> whether it's whether it's that. Like, I just had one, gosh, last night, and I was on the infield spinning my cranks back, you know, checking the tension on my chain, and some 10-year-old, you know, and this is all in the dream, some 10-year-old yells, go get a new chain, you know, just – just weird stuff like that, but three, four times a week, I will have a BMX dream related dream, you know, and it's just because it was, it was just such a big part of my life that mm-hmm. I thrived on and enjoyed and loved that, you know, I, I was pretty lucky, man. I mean, I, I count my blessings because, you know, growing up, growing up on the east side of San Jose, which is pretty rough, you know, I definitely could have. You know, there was a time where I got to a fork in the road and I definitely could have ventured down that other road and I wouldn't be here today having this conversation with you. And, you know, quite frankly, I may have, you know, spent some time and, you know, maybe had a little vacation time in some public institutions, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. you know real, real talk, because I wasn't, uh, you know, I was, I was surrounded by that element, but I was fortunate enough, uh, fortunate enough to have a mom that kind of veered me back on course, you know, but I got to a fork in the road where I could have, you know, I could have gone down that road. And if it wasn't for, you know, like the well, Hall family and, you know, mm-hmm. carting me around, I, I totally took the right road and, you know. Tell, tell me about that fork. I didn't know about this fork that you had there. Oh, man. So, you know, growing up as a kid, I, before the time of, you know, of BMX and before I got involved in the sport, I got in a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of trouble, you know. Um, never really got involved in, you know, the drug thing or alcohol thing, but, you know, just, you know, running with some kids, you know, and busting windows in construction zones, you know, and, you know, vandalizing some stuff and, you know, did a little bit of time in, in a juvenile hall, you know, um, you know, probably, you know, three weeks here, a couple weeks here, you know, and, you ended up, you know, getting on probation a little bit and, and it just, I don't want to say typical juvenile hall kid stuff because, you know, none of it was good, you right. know, but you know, there, you know, I just kind of, when you're in that element, you kind of get drawn to it a little bit and not to make any excuses, but, you know, I was in that element and, you know, was, ju- you know, kid, 13, 14 years old, had gone to juvenile hall a couple of times and ended up being on probation for a little bit, you know, and one time I got into, I can't remember what I got in trouble for, but I got in trouble and um, my probation officer at the time said, Hey, you know, next time you get in trouble, it's, it's going to be a big deal. And I'm like, okay. So then at that point in time, I started getting involved with the BMX thing and, you know, started doing that. And then started just traveling with, you know, the halls, Chris Hall and his family and his dad just kind of took me under their wing and started going to all the, you know, the local races and stuff like that racing, you know, 
I I beat his house, you know, or they pick me up at, you know, seven in the morning on Saturday and we'd go to, there was a Fred Watson park, Hellier park, and then just be gone all weekend. So if it wasn't for that family and me going down that other road, I, I definitely would have been in a different spot. Yikes. Well, yeah. let's, let's quickly, I know, and then I think this is where we get to a spot where a lot of people know about your career. Um, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but how'd you get on the firm? And that was like, Oh gosh. I don't so, even know how to get started with that whole program. Yeah. There oh was my gosh. So layers of that. Jeez. So after the whole Hutch. And, and for those that don't know, the firm is nicknamed for like GT, Powerlight, yeah. Robinson, like all through four of these companies, Dino, were all owned by the same company. And it was called the firm because it was like the company that supported the gosh, entire who, sport. Oh my, I can't even remember who dubbed. Who came up with was it Greg Romero or somebody that nicknamed <laughs> the firm? I mean, it could have been, I don't know. But I you know, that's it. Mm, that, was pretty, mm, that was pretty appropriate. You know, the firm. Completely. That was, that like, was pretty and that was another level too. Like that whole program was that was another level. Like, like that was like a pulled out of the motocross playbook where it was just like, yeah. here's the setup, here's the design, here's everything. Like it, it, you guys were like protected as well, like for example. Um, you were riding those ugly spin mags in yeah. Orlando, Florida. You yeah. came up short on a double, yeah. you cracked them. I heard yeah. it. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> so I went over to the pit, and before I could even add, I'm like, hey, where's Charles? And then before I could even look and find you, Brian Gass, <laughs> in my face. <laughs> Looking for Craig. <laughs> so I'm, I'm like, oh, I'm going to go talk to Charles, man. You break that mag, and he's like, no, nah, dude, he, he's fine. Don't, and he just dodged, like, totally in my face. And I'm like, Brian, I know he, but I just want to clown him a little bit. And he's like, oh, no, nah, yeah. dude. And I'm like, all right, I'll see you later. <laughs> that was awesome. You know, it's, it's, I try, I try to keep up on the sport a little bit, you know, what's going on, but not too much because then I start thinking, oh, I could still do it. And, you know, the mind still thinks you can do it, but, you know, being 55, the body don't follow. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Body don't follow. So I, you know, I want to, I want to say two things about that. One, I really, you know, again, Bill Nelson and I were talking about this when you and I, Danny Nelson, uh, you know, that era guys, cause you and Danny Nelson were kind of a little bit after, you know, my yes. generation, mm-hmm. but my generation and back. So Gary Ellis, Harry, Larry, Eddie King, Greg Hill, you know, and all that generation. And then up to your generation and Jason Richardson, I think that the sport of BMX, as far as like factory sponsors and teams and stuff like that has, has kind of gone away. Yep. Now what you see now is, and what you see now is a lot more of factory team slash grassroots program, Mm -hmm. which is a good thing which is a good thing. I'm not knocking it, but I don't ever think the sport will be how it was from your generation back. If that makes any sense. And not to diss on anything that's going on right now in the sport, because I think it's, it's gone leaps and bounds, but it's just, it's the sport has grown leaps and bounds, but as far as like sponsorships and stuff like that, and that part of it is kind of regressed. And it's weird because I think about it sometimes and try to figure out why it's done that. But you know, you're like I said, your generation back, you know, I don't ever think the sport will be like it used to be, you know what I right. mean? Mm-hmm. But what the sport has done now with the factory slash grassroots program, I think that's, I think they're, they're doing what they need to do to, you know, to make it work. Right. To grow um, and bring in the kids that aren't necessarily yeah. going to be on a factory team, but they're right. going to be supported. Right. And I think a lot yeah. of it has to do with how many companies there are. There's only so much money that's going right. in and mm-hmm. it's going to get all diluted to so many different brands. That yeah. there isn't one company outside of maybe Chase, I don't know, yeah. or maybe a couple of them that can yeah. really support somebody, pay them a salary, get them to the events. Yeah. That's yeah. also, you know, Kristoff and he knowing what that what that yeah. era was like, and this right. is how you take care right. of your people. Right. So I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know the answer either. I don't know. And you know, from and again, you know, like from your era back, you had such a gap between the kids that or the people that were factory sponsored, so to say, and getting product and getting expenses paid. There was such, there was such a gap there. Whereas Mm -hmm. now with the programs today, that gap isn't so big. So in my opinion, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. But on the flip side of that, you don't have, you know, because when we were, you know, again, you know, your generation and back, I mean, the top 15 pros were probably making a living. Yes. Yeah. Totally. 
and and it's by far you know no Michael Jordan salary you know no LeBron James salary but you know back then in our era you know tw- you know being you know mid twenties late twenties early thirties you know making sixty hundred thousand dollars a year you know that Crazy. that was good money you know for traveling the world on somebody else's ticket right you know and that's equivalent to somebody who's a really good mechanic at a Porsche dealership. You know, for real. Yeah. So back then, you know, there was a huge gap. Now in the sport, I see there's not that gap like that, but it's it's definitely different. Definitely yeah. different. It but is. I know that I know that we went off on a tangent a little bit, but back in the to go back to your question, after Hutch had kind of dissolved their program and, and all that stuff, um, there was a window of time there where I was kind of sponsorless. And I got hooked up with the Martinos. Mm, I remember that. Yes. Forgot that. At Psychocraft. Yeah. Cool people. Just yep. cool. I mean, just down to earth, good people like most yep. people in BMX. Right. So I, I don't remember how it all came about, but I approached them about, you know, them getting me hooked up and, you know, they were a small, small team and, you know, building bikes, you know, out of a small facility and um, got hooked up with them, went to a couple races, did pretty well, you know, did pretty well. And, um, they got me to some races and then the opportunity came up with CW and yeah. So the opportunity Forget about CW yeah. all of the yeah. time. Yeah. yeah it's so like the, when I, I did this with Tommy Bracken, then I forgot he was on power light. I get so yeah, stupid. Yeah, I'm like, I know yeah, yeah. this. Yeah. yeah. Oh. All right. So the, opp- yep. the, the, the opportunity came up with CW. Wait, did you have to ride those ugly bars? No, dude. Or they they, they stop making no, it. No, 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 no. What happened? I got lucky. So <laughs> <laughs> you got lucky because them things were horrible. The worst handlebars no, ever. They were the and but God, people who liked them swore by them. You know, oh, like Bob, like Bob Madrano who rode for Skyway Tough was back in there. He swore by them. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I got lucky because at the time, CW had started a little, um, and it, it, this one evolves, but it started a little little company called Shadow Racing. I remember. And he did a pair of normal bars. So that's how I kind of skirted that. I said, hey, can I just run those shadow bars? He's like, oh, okay. Because I didn't like the CW bars. So uh, for, so I was on I was on Cyclecraft for a couple, I want to say almost maybe like nine months. I got to some races, started winning some races and stuff as a pro. And the opportunity came up with CW. And I really felt one, probably one of the hardest phone calls was to call the Martinos and let them yeah. know that I was going to go and ride for CW because they were just great people, you know, stayed at their house in Kingsport, Tennessee and yep, just super cool people love them to death. But at the time it was just, that was the next move I had to take. And at the time, I think they were pretty upset with me, but then as time went on, they, they kind of knew that it was the next step that I had to take. So ended up racing for CW for that, you know, for that year did really, really well. And then at the ABA Grands one year, or prior to that, I get a call from Roger, the owner of CW. He says, hey, so we're going to start a new line of bikes. I'm like, okay. He goes, it's going to be called RevCore. I'm like, okay, okay. So this was probably about three months before the Grands. So he sends me a new bike. So I put this new bike together. And um, Friday night at the Pro Spectacular, I raced in CW stuff. And then the next day for the Grands, I raced in RevCore stuff. What? Yeah. Yeah. So everybody. What was, was the difference of, between the bikes? Like, was there any difference? Or they aesthetics. just rebranded? Yeah. Okay. Just, just aesthetics. You know, <laughs> they added a gusset here and did this yeah. and changed the dropout. Yeah. But the overall geometry was the same. So the transition was, was seamless. Okay. Yes. Um, but yeah, so I rode for CW, then it turned into RevCore, and then raced for RevCore for, you know, for God, or CW for maybe two years, something like that. Then the opportunity came up with Diamondback. What? Yeah, I know. I sound like, I kind of sound like a little sponsor whore right now. But. No, you've got some good <laughs> rides, though, dude. It, it's, it, it's so awesome because a lot of people have so many sponsor issues and like, I got kicked off of this or I couldn't find a ride. And I'm like, some of the greatest people that are in our sport 
having sponsor issues. And I'm like, man, that's just commonplace, I guess. But your story, man, Jesus. Yeah. Ah, I, I'm going to go from know. this great team to a lateral move to this great <laughs> team to another lateral move to this great team. I'm going to trade in the oh, Porsche oh, to oh, get oh, another oh. Porsche. Yeah. To get another oh, Porsche. Yeah. Well, okay. Fortunately, fortunately, fortunately enough, it was just the natural, natural progression, you know, I kind of, so the whole diamondback thing came about, um, you know, Harry Leary had approached me and, you know, I said, yeah, sure. You know, it just kind of all worked, you know, not to go into great details, but there were some, some rumblings going on with CW about what their programs are going to be. So anyway, so I just moved over to diamondback. That was a great year. Learned a lot from Harry, raced with Matt, you know, for Matt Hayden for that whole yep. year. But then again, you know, that right about that time is when the whole mountain bike industry was starting to boom and all that stuff. So a lot of companies were taking money from their juvenile, you know, yeah. they call the BMX line juvenile line, and they were taking money from their juvenile line to support their mountain bike stuff. So at that time, um, Diamondback did away with their program. So here again, at the beginning of the year, I'm sponsorless. And I thought, okay, you know, what am I going to do? And, you know, just like my knucklehead itself, I just kept perse persevering, persevering, went to Reno as a, um, that next year, I can't remember the time frame, mm -hmm. and just had, you know, JT leathers, JT jersey, and kind of did the independent thing for a little bit. And that was right about the time when GT Bicycles had purchased Powerlight. And didn't really even know about it. I don't think anybody really knew. And then I got a call from Todd Huffman one weekend. And he said, hey, between you and I in a fence post, but we're, we've acquired Powerlight Racing. I'm like, wow, okay. And we want you to come on board to represent the Powerlight side. I'm like, oh, okay, great. So I was ecstatic because I was going to become part of this great company, or, you know, another great company. But it was kind of nerve wracking a little bit because that time for it to happen, they still had to finish up their loose ends with acquiring a company, whatever they want to do. So there's about a three, four month period where I was still sponsorless, but knew that this was coming to fruition. Right. So there was a little bit of a window there, but then, so that's my first to an answer question. That was my first um, foot in the door with the firm, so to say. And then I raced for Powerlight for, you know, a year or two. And then they trans transitioned me over to the Robinson side. Because at that time, Greg Hill was still racing for Robinson. And then he went on to retire. And then they moved me over to Robinson. And then I had been there for, you know, for the duration of my career. And it was, I love the firm, great people, you know, had a really good time and wouldn't, wouldn't change it for the world. That's awesome. That's, and again, listening to that whole story that 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 trajectory from the beginning to now until where you, where you ended up that is fascinating stuff yeah the people that were were so supportive of you and i think again charles i think it's because you're just a good guy like there that that speaks volumes to your character well you know i i have a firm belief that we can't please everybody all the time right and if you are you're doing something wrong because along the way along the way in life you're always going to piss somebody off but I think for the most part, the people that I've met and I'd like to think there's maybe one or two people that, you know, you've been there, Craig, where you've gone out and you've done clinics, you know, on the weekends and, you know, you've done, you know, we've done, you know, one weekend you have a national the next weekend you have a national. And then that week you're back there doing clinics and stuff. And sometimes yes. I think about the, the youngsters that we've come across, you know, back then, the, you know, when we were in our 20s, you know, the kids that were in our clinics that were 11, 12, 13. Mm -hmm. I like to think back at moments like that to just think that if I could have inspired one or two, you know, of those little kids to whether it was BMX or do something else in life that I've said something to them that have made them, you know, keep moving forward, then Dude, it's it's all good. But I, I think for the most part, and yeah, you know, back in the BMX days, you know, I'm sure I, you know, I know that like T John Purse and I, we've gotten into a tussle and, you know, Matt and Matt and I are pretty good friends and we've gotten into a little bit of a tussle. We've all had our little bit of tussles, but I think genuinely, you know, as as in the sport of BMX, I think genuinely we know who the good people are and who are the kind hearted people, you know, deep down inside. And I just try to, 
I just try to be myself and I try to help out as many people as I can along the way, you know, and if I piss off a couple of people doing it, then, you know, so be it. But, you know, it's life's too short to be, you know, trying to get over on people. You know? Right. So I Which, just try to. Yeah, we and I don't want to take too much more of your time. I already said it, but we, yeah. we, you and I can keep doing this forever. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. At some point, Zoom's going to come in and go, "You have you done?" <laughs> Don't even ahead. Um, what do you think that you learned from your racing career? And I think what you just said was really poignant about trying not to get over on somebody. Um, you're now in auto sales, right? And you have been for yep. quite some time. Yep. What did you take from your whole career that you applied? to because you're successful at what you do now otherwise you st wouldn't still be doing it and as long as i've known you you've been doing it um mm -hmm. what do you think that you've taken from that to, to be successful where you are now not to uh not to give up when there's a when there's a roadblock you know with with bmx you know any athlete any sport when you have that athlete mentality you know this whole you know, may his soul rest in peace, but this whole Mamba attitude, it's just like, dude, you got to persevere. You got to get over. You got to do what you got to do. You know, just keep moving forward. That's transitioned into, into life just in general, whether it's work, kids, family, you, you've got to just keep persevering because like yourself and most BMXers, and BMX for me, I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth. You know, I wasn't, I didn't have the parent that was able to get me that, you know, blinged out bike and all the latest and the greatest and the coolest shit that was out there. I, I, we, we came from the day you run what you brung. You know what I mean? <laughs> if you had some big ass box bars and the, you remember the, uh, the aluminum fluted seat posts and shit, you, yes. you, you know, what gear do you got on your bike? I don't know, whatever it was on there when I bought it, you know, you run, you run what you brung. And with myself and BMX, I just had to, I had to work for everything that I got. And in life now, especially, you know, in my type of work, it's just, I, I get thrown obstacles all day long, you know, whether it's because, you know, as you know, I'm a finance manager in a dealership. So, you know, it's dealing with the banks, dealing with that. So what I've taken from BMX into my work life is like, you just got to keep going and keep moving forward. And you just got to get over the next obstacle to be able to get to that next objective to just, you know, keep persevering, you know, and I was talking to my lovely aunt the other day who lives in Los Angeles and she goes, you were, so, she goes, I'm so proud of you because you were so successful, you know, with your BMAX and traveling the world and, you know, and taking that bicycle to the highest mountains and, you know, you're, you're doing well in work. And it's like, well, I just tell her, I'm like, I'm too thick headed and knuckle headed to know any difference. <laughs> you know? um, too, and I think about that sometimes, you know, because, you know, when Robinson decided to do away with their program, you know, cut back and, you know, they cut me from the program and all that stuff, which, you know, at that time I was upset and pissed. I'm like, how can they do that to me? But looking back at it, I think to myself, yeah, I was probably on the, on the back end of my career. And, right. and I get that, you know, mm -hmm. when we're young athletes and we don't want to see that we're getting cut from a team because of our performance ability, you know? And I right. remember, I remember I got a phone call from Todd Corbett, love him to death, dude. Oh my God. And he said, Hey, you know, so come the end of the year, they're not going to renew your contract because they're just going a different way. This, this, and that blah, 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 blah. And I said, and he, he gave me a heads up. It was like six months prior. Right. He said, okay. And I was pissed. I was hurt. I was bummed at that moment. But looking back at it, I understood. Now I understand why they had to do it. And, and I get that, you know, but after I got cut from the team, I decided to try to do my own program. So I gathered up a bunch of sponsors to try to get to the next race and this and that, you know, had a frame sponsor, had a apparel sponsor, and I pulled all these funds to be able to try to get me to the next race. And I used frequent flyer miles and all that stuff. So I kind of funded my own program for like a year, you know, the ABA let me crash on their floor and stuff like that. So totally cool for that. Yeah. But I guess what I'm getting at is when, Ro when Robinson cut their program, I guess I should have just left it alone, but because of my love for the sport and my thick headedness, I just wanted to keep going, you know, because there was right. a point in time where I thought, you know what, I'm going to prove these mother suckers wrong. You know, I'm, I'm going to go out there and do it on my own and I'm going to wax these guys. 
but I was just too bullheaded and thick-headed to realize, you know, dude, you're on a tail in your career. You just need to leave well enough alone. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, with, and with work now, you know, I just, because of my attitude that I had with BMX, just to persevere, keep going, you got to get it done, you know, do whatever it takes that's flowed over into, you know, everyday work life and just life in general. And I think that that platform that I learned in BMX just to never give up has, you know, carried over into my work life because I think you don't have anyone to fall back on, right? We're as as us racing as an individual sport. It's not like you could count on someone behind you to catch the ball if you tripped and stumbled and fell. Like it's all you. Yeah. 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 And to me, to me in life, and I've kind of gotten spoiled because to me in life, success is not how much money you got in the bank, how big of a house you've got, you know, how many sneakers you got success. My definition is doing something that you enjoy doing. And if you can get paid along the way and pay off your bills and all that stuff, all the better. So I've gotten spoiled because, and you, because we, we, I don't want to say were, but in that sense, we were successful. Totally. We were successful. Yep. And now, now for me, going into the car business that I've been in for um, umpteen years, yes, I consider myself successful because I do enjoy it to an extent and I'm able to pay my bills. But when I have the two to compare my successfulness in BMX and my successfulness in, you know, outside of the world and in the car industry, I was way more successful right. with BMX. And only because, not to say that I don't enjoy what I'm doing, but I enjoyed right. BMX a whole lot more. Of course. And, 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 and if it wasn't for my success in BMX, I would look at my success in the car business being greater, but if that makes sense, but I've gotten spoiled and I know what this other success was like. That's the hard part when you get away from it and you're like, wait, this is the real world. Oh, yeah. I need to go back. Like I need to go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let me get back in here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, in BMX for the most part, we only had ourselves to answer to for, for the most part, you know, we had team managers, team managers yeah. say, Hey, you know um, this, this or that. But now in the real world, you know, we've got upper management to answer to, you know, it's like, what, dude, why are you jocking me like that? Dude, as long as the shit's getting done, get off my back, you know? <laughs> so sometimes I've got to remember that, that I've got uppers, you know, yes. upper management that I need to answer to. So I, sometimes I got to tread lightly. And sometimes I just want to tell them like, dude, you can just pound sand. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know who you're talking to? Right. Yeah, you know, I'm in the BMX Hall of Fame. I'm Charles Townsend. <laughs> Shoot. Are you crazy? Let me go get my plaque. I'm going to show it to you. What year did you go in? What year did you get inducted? Oh, was it 14? Yeah, I'm bummed out I missed that one. I wish I had Oh, you know what, dude? It's, you know, it's not like you live around the corner. You're clear, right, yeah. clear across True. the country. So I'll give you a pass on True. that one. I'll Thank give you. you. I appreciate it. All right. Hey, but you know what, man? I'm, uh, you know, California's getting expensive and they're doing, uh, you know, our, our, our governor's, you know, crazy doing some wacky stuff and well, California's, yeah. California's getting expensive, bro. I've been, I've, I've been looking out your way, you know, you are not the first person that has said that, dude. Like <laughs> there are so many people that are like, yeah, what's North Carolina? Like, I'm like, dude, the cost of living here is ridiculous. Like the first time I moved here, they're like, don't live in Mecklenburg County. The, 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 the property tax is crazy. And then when I saw the property tax, I was like, hold on, I mean, I'm going to pay oh. Here, take it right now. They paid this for a couple years in event. <laughs> Dude, real. you know the ga- gas here this morning, the cheap stuff is four dollars and ninety cents. Nope. And that's that's in the Sacramento area where my aunt lives in L- my aunt lives in LA, LA. The cheap stuff there is five bucks gallon. Nope. Yeah. So I don't know, nope. man. I I've been, you know, oh Charles, I'll, jump on a plane. I'll come pick you up and I'll give you the tour. <laughs> I don't know though. That's that summertime humidity does nothing for this hair, yo. Me, yeah, just cut, shave your head, dude. Just shave your head. Yeah, I'm, get, I'm getting there, dude. I'm, I'm getting. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you. I'm about ready to walk into the place and say, "I need the Craig Reynolds special." Dude, just come. I'll cut your hair. Just roll in. Bring it on. I'll take care of the whole dome. <laughs> Might take a couple of hours. That giant. Oh, uh, see, I knew hey. we were going there. You're gonna charge me a little bit extra for the I'm, extra mileage. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna have to sharpen up my blades. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, you might have Charles. Man, it, it has been so fun to catch up, and this is 
a true testament to friendship because it feels like I've just saw you yesterday, yeah. but I haven't talked to you in forever, man, outside of those text messages. So um, what a treat to get a chance to catch up with you, even though I've been asking you for months. Dude, you know, Craig, it's it's definitely a pleasure. I haven't done, I, gosh, I don't think I've done very many of these, but you know, Craig, I, you know, you're cool people, your family are cool people, you know, your parents, everybody. I, you know, it, and as you know, it wasn't that I didn't want to do it. It's just, you know, our work schedules and all that stuff and life Busy. happens. Busy. You're the best. And it's definitely my pleasure, dude. It was, it was definitely my pleasure. So I'm going to leave you with this one thing. I remember one time we were behind the gate and I said, good luck. And you said, Hey man, listen, when I don't respond, it doesn't mean I don't wish you well, but my mom told me if I tell someone good luck, I'm giving my good luck away. And I said, True. Oh dude. All right. And True. I respected that because I was like, True. that's awesome. Cause now to this day, when I say it, I'm like, Oh wait, hold on. Should I, what, how do I say this? What should I say? But I remember that. And it was, I remember, I swear we were right behind the gate getting ready. to. Yeah. Come yeah I remember that. that. I so remember that. That's that, that's that Asian culture wisdom that my mom had, you know? Uh -huh. it, it, yeah. Yeah. I remember that Craig. Wow. It was awesome. Yeah. I love that, man. That was just one of the many times of great memories with you. And I, I have, it was an honor and a pleasure spending that time with you, Charles. Thank you. No worries, my brother. No worries. You take care All of right. yourself. Right? You as All well. Right. If you guys like what you're seeing, make sure you subscribe right here. And if you're listening to Apple Podcasts, subscribe there as well. Charles Townsend, you're the man, dude. All right, brother. You, you take care. Soon. I'll talk to you later. All right, brother. Peace. See you. All right.